Hi folks, I'm here in the Wallace Collection yet again and uh, we're here for a special day, a conference day, in fact it's two days, uh, but I'm only here for one of these. Um, all depends upon the Brave and it's um, essentially a, an assortment of lectures and studies looking at recent research into Oriental, Middle Eastern and Asian arms and armour and related topics. Um, so you guys will know Toby from various videos that we've done together in the past. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Michael Spink and I am uh, helping to research the Indian and Persian edge weapons in the museum. Great, so how did you get involved uh, with this topic to begin with? Uh, well, I've been involved broadly with uh, Islamic and Indian objects and arms and armour for, uh, dare I say it, approaching 40 years. Um, but uh, specifically with this project, um, to Toby was kind enough to invite me to become one of the team and to look specifically at the Indian and Persian edge weapons. So which particular aspect of, of the study of, um, of these sorts of weapons and this area of weapons is Draw, has drawn you to, to, to it? Is it the artistic aspect or the historical aspect or a mixture of all of them? Well, one of the things the research projects brought up is that there are multiple aspects on every single weapon. So with the cataloguing project, we're starting off with the basic cataloguing uh, data. So what the object is, when it was made, what it's made of and so on and so forth. But one of the things that is coming very much to the fore with some of the objects, and, and it forms a nice group, uh, are the jewellers and goldsmiths techniques used to enhance them. These are often weapons of high social stature. Um, there's a wonderful Mughal dagger in the collection. And uh, the goldsmiths work and techniques used on that are found on other works of art in other museums, the Victorian Albert Museum and elsewhere. And these are uh, techniques that the understanding of which we can bring to bear on the weapon so that we don't only look at them as sharp objects uh, mm. but as works of art in their own right. Yes, it was, I think it was very interesting in uh, the lecture which I'll uh, show some of um, that you tied it in with these other non-weapon objects and that's very useful for dating isn't it? I think you can get a lot for dating. I mean, mm -hmm. in the lecture I particularly referred to uh, a bowl and cover that's in the Wallace collection that bears a date. There's nothing better than an object that actually bears a genuine date on it. Mm -hmm. um, but looking across, you can uh, look at um, hooker bases, bowls, spoons, or what have you, on which one can, for other reasons, form a view on the date, and then cross-reference that and the enamel decoration into the um, uh, fittings on a sword, the scabbard fittings, the quillens, the hilt. Mm -hmm. In terms of a, a field to study, is there a lot written in English about this topic? Um, or is it something you have to go to um, antiquarian works that have been written in the 19th century in some cases? Uh, or where do you draw all of the knowledge from? I think one of the aspects is that it's, it's multiple, di multiple disciplines. So mm. one's looking at jewellery. Um, so you need to understand and perhaps be reading books on Indian jewellery, of which there are a number. Um, you need to be looking at books on specifically weapons, and those do tend to be earlier publications. There's rel relatively little, there's a recent catalogue from the Metropolitan Museum, but this project is in fact quite groundbreaking mm -hmm. because there is so little. So yeah. the, the uh, Arms and Armour project is, is uh, quite novel in bringing together so many different disciplines. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried to increase my knowledge on uh, particularly Indo-Persian weapons and particularly uh, tulwars because it's something I'm personally interested in. And I just, I find it really difficult to find very much to read on the topic. And a lot of what is written is from the 19th century and very clearly some of it is a dubious, uh, you know, sort of um, historical correctness, shall we say. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it is, like you say, it does seem very, very groundbreaking. I mean, certainly there's a lot of things I've heard this morning. I had not heard at all before and I'm mostly focused on European uh, arms and armour but like I say it's a field that I think is very very interesting um, and it's great that it's you know being done. Um, Toby from your perspective how does this tie in with you know the future of the world spectrum and the collection that's here I mean is it is it very much a, a sort of an emerging field as it were? Uh, yeah I mean <clears throat> I'm really proud of the Wallace collection as a as an institution that still really prizes research mm -hmm. and, and, and everybody who works in this museum understands that the research and the collection and the knowledge of that is what facilitates everybody's job. You know, mm -hmm. Everybody who works here needs to know about more about this collection. And of course, that, that, it goes without saying that there's a moral imperative for us as a national museum to, to tell people 
if we find anything out. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Research and knowledge is valueless unless you have you know good methods for getting it out there. Mm -hmm. So we 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 start you know we've been thinking very very hard about how many different ways can we disseminate the research, mm -hmm. as well as how much research can we do. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's really important to us as, as an institution. It's one of the things that really characterizes it. And the funny thing is that overwhelmingly, the Wallace is a really well cataloged collection. You know, it, 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 it opened as a public museum in 1900. And almost as soon as the doors of Hartford House were open, there were scholars working very intensely on this collection. And you see, almost as soon as the place opens, you see a parade of specialist catalogs being published. Right. It's not just the Arms and Armor, first edition of the Arms and Armor comes out very rapidly. Mm -hmm. But then you have furniture, paintings, miniatures, set porcelain, gold boxes. You know, it's, it's all coming out. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it all kind of comes out of the fact that we're a comparatively small place with very, very rich collections. Mm -hmm. of a richness and range that are unusual for a museum of this size. So we're perfectly placed to be doing the research. We're small enough to make comprehensive research practical and achievable, mm -hmm. and we're rich enough to make it a worthwhile process. It's not a catalog of junk, it's a catalog of quite good things. Uh, so we have a wonderful agility that, that is really quite special. But despite all of that, a hundred or more years now of pretty intensive scholarship, the, the um, what's traditionally been referred to as the Oriental Armory uh, is the last part of the collection that's never really been properly cataloged. There was a publication in 1913-14 by Sir Guy Francis Lakin, uh, which was called a catalog on the cover, mm -hmm. but it's not really a catalog. Mm -hmm. It's a brief description organized according to the way things were displayed on the walls in the early 20th century. It's a hand list to your self-guided tour of the museum. It's not a, a catalog raisonné. It's not a scholarly publication that actually tells you really what the stuff is. And we've never had that. So now, with this project, we're, we've got 100 years of catch-up to do. We've got to get the, the Oriental Armory onto the same level as the rest of the collection. The rest of the collection's had a century and you know, so far we've had five years. I think you know, we're nearly there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I've always thought it was a shame, in a way, that more work wasn't done a lot earlier, like a hundred years ago or more, on on the Oriental and Asian um, items, because they were so much closer to the time that a lot of those things were actually made. Uh, and you know, mm -hmm. the the auctions that they came from in Paris, you know, some of them were only maybe fifty years after the objects were made. Mm -hmm. right? So you're, you're touching on a very critical thing there, and that is that uh, these objects have been in the collection since the 1870s, mm -hmm. and we can then, at a sweep, remove a lot of the impediments that are attached to objects that recently come on the market, which is mm -hmm. who made them, when, are they more recent fakes or are they not? Mm -hmm. At the very worst, so to speak, we're talking about things uh, adjusted and, and made during the first half of the 19th century mm -hmm. with some earlier things. Um, and I think it is a very important part of the cataloging to realize that the issues of, of modern forgery are not relevant in this collection. And, and to me, cataloging them, that, that's very significant. Mm. I have one specific question, which is to both of you as well, and that's the, the nature of the way that, particularly Indo-Persian, but also some to a degree, uh, Ottoman and, and um, Middle Eastern um, weapons are constructed, can often mean that hilts and blades can be separated, changed, updated, blah, blah, blah. Um, because often the blades are essentially glued into the hilts, or in other ways married in a less permanent way than they are often with European weapons. Um, does this introduce any challenge? Because I mean, I know that, for example, some Indian swords have Syrian or you know other Middle Eastern blades on them. Have obviously been imported in and married, or German blades. Yeah, and that are two hundred years earlier. Yeah, yeah and that happened as well. Of course, the, the yeah. local Emperor Jahangir had German blades. Um, a, a contemporary account written right at the beginning of the 17th century right. says that Jahangir had 2,000 German blades in his treasury. Right. You know, so this isn't something new. And mm -hmm. I think one's got to distinguish between the more recent marriage, um, particularly in, say, the mid-19th century, where the objects were being enhanced for the English milord or whoever to buy in the mm -hmm. auctions, and uh, other situations where, for instance, the rulers of Sindh in northwest India, now Pakistan, mm -hmm. 
were known collectors of fine blades and they had agents all around Iran buying blades for them and they then fitted their own hilts to them. So the, the notion of a fine blade as a collector's object goes right back into the 17th century mm -hmm. and the notion of collecting European blades because they had certain characteristics that were better than mm -hmm. some of the Eastern blades goes back to the beginning of the 17th century so um, mm -hmm. nothing's new under the sun. And it has a lot also to do with your expectation for an artifact or an object. You know, it's very easy to look at something as romantic as a sword and take it to be uh, a wonderfully tangible snapshot of a particular moment in history. But it isn't. Mm -hmm. An object is a story through time. And, and if you look at it as a story, some of, some of which goes back quite a long way sometimes, mm -hmm. then you're on a much better level. And, and you know, our catalog descriptions uh, and, and analysis tend to read very much more like a story yes. than they are this is a this and that's a that. And I think, you know, to a certain degree, um, modern archaeology has something to answer for in that regard. I mean, my background's in archaeology, but, you know, programs like Time Team have given the public a perception of this is an object from X date, and that is, you know, it's a, um, almost like a coin being stamped at that date, and, and that was it. That was it. But like you say, a lot of these weapons continued in use, particularly, obviously, famously in India, where we see 16th, 17th century blades later being rehilted in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. A good blade was something to be prized. Obviously, we see it with Japanese swords as well, mm -hmm. um, famously um, so. But it must introduce some challenges when you're trying to um, when you're trying to study the history of the development or the styles of weapons, even the decoration of weapons, when you don't necessarily um, you don't necessarily have the book already written to go, okay, this blade dates mm. to the 17th century, if it doesn't have any well, It's disentangling the story yeah. and, and looking yeah. at it and saying, maybe it's over a number of phases, it's not necessarily mm. all in one go. So mm. you could be looking at uh, an object that maybe has gone through um, one, two, or even three phases of enhancement mm. to bring it up to its present state today. And it, as, as Toby says, those are all part of its history, and you can't ignore or just sweep that away mm. because that's what the object is. Yeah, and it's interesting in your, in your lecture as well, talking about the decorative elements, which I have not paid as much attention to as someone who's primarily interested in weapons and armour, mm -hmm. and, and uh, not knowing so much about the art history in, in India, for example, Lucknow, and the, the symbology uh, that were used in certain um, cities and states in, in India, I think it's very interesting because you can actually pin down, maybe certain, pin it down to certain generations with that type of detail. Um, Whereas a, a, a toolbar, for example, it's sometimes very a basic one, is very difficult to date because they stayed the same for, for 200 years. And they got re enhanced later on, so yeah. maybe someone took it out and re gilded the hilt yes. um, because it was needed, or maybe there was a big derbar coming up. Yeah, well, hang on, I better find something nice into the treasury, pull out something, and, yeah. and do it up. So, in some cases, the decoration, the details can help you pin down something a bit more specific yeah. about yeah. the history rather than just going, it's a Qatar, it's a Tawar, mm. it could date from anywhere between that. So, that's um, fascinating stuff. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap it up there, but thank you very much to yeah. Michael and, and Toby. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.